It's no surprise that many gamers are really finding it hard to trust AAAs these days. One large reason is that trailers, frankly, are often not representative of the final product. We're so used to graphical, sometimes even mechanical downgrades, that it's practically normal, even expected now. Well, the most recent Anthem expose revealed what actually happened behind the scenes of its reveal trailer. And because of that, it's a perfect opportunity to explain how this actually happens. There's a lot more at play here, a lot more than meets the eye. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another edition of The Deep Dive. Of course, a massive thank you to our patrons for funding this show. They're the backbone of what we're doing, and they get Deep Dive episodes around a week early, with our next episode being live there very soon. Video game downgrades are a fairly large problem, but they are one that actually stem from a fairly clear part of the development process. So clear that I can even show you how one of my games played into this problem. So, E3 trailers. You see these games. They look stunning. You get hyped up and then you feel a bit crushed when the final game comes out, often looking significantly worse than the trailer that got you excited in the first place. Now, sure, there may have been a pre-alpha disclaimer there, but, you know, we feel what we see, and what does pre-alpha even mean? And this is where the developer and consumer perspective will be very different. To a consumer, they'll see pre-alpha, and they'll think, oh, well, the game isn't even an alpha yet, and it looks this good? It's entirely reasonable and logical to see it that way, thinking, wow, this game will only get better over time. Well, from a developer's point of view, pre-alpha probably won't mean that. You see, in the pre-alpha part of development, well, what's actually happening is, you know, the engineers are going, they're prototyping new graphical techniques and things like that. It's work that is, you know, being done to see how far the boat can be pushed for the project. So when a developer sees an E3 trailer, they know that that's really the best the studio has to show. It's what they'd love to do. And, you know, that maybe not everything will pan out that way in a broad range of hardware. And we have to be realistic. If more customers viewed trailers in that way, then those trailers would be less effective. And this absolutely is something that publishers do play into. Their disclaimer does mean that they're technically fine, but yeah, it's pretty sneaky. Anthem highlighted this perfectly, so let's take a look through its reveal trailer, especially given what we now know about the game's development process. The trailer starts off with a more dynamic looking version of the Fort Tarsis hub. There are more NPCs, the place has more life, there are far more graphical effects at play. Basically, it looks like a scene from a movie. Why is this? Well, at the time of creation, the real version of it probably wasn't implemented, so the director would have told the designers, you know, the requirements of the scene for the demo, and then the people would have went and made that scene. At this point, considerations about how that scene would overall fit into the final gameplay don't really matter as much. The only job is to really display the fantasy of the game. As the trailer progresses, we then get into our suit. This sequence is clearly very tightly scripted. Uh, just look at how um, Zoe is waiting for you. In a real game, that wouldn't really happen every time. It would be kind of repetitive. And that's something that tells you that this is a very specific set of interactions crafted for this demo. So once you enter your javelin, it dips to black. It then cuts into a, I'm 99% sure, pre-rendered sequence of you and your javelin. Now, note how the camera gets close to the javelin's shoulder, but it actually masks a camera cut. Yeah, that's just like a cut in the movie Birdman. So chances are that Tarsus segment is one video file, the pre-rendered bit in the middle is another video file, and the actual gameplay sequence is another video file. And you know, it's all assembled together in video editing software. Of course, it wouldn't have been direct capture or anything like that. And that all does sort of make sense. Indeed, if you look at the changes in lighting between the Tarsus scene, the pre-rendered scene, and the gameplay scene, it seems pretty obvious. Now, this masks the loading screen that would be there in the actual game, but doing it in this way would be impossible in the real game because the pre-rendered bit would not be able to account for the different javelins uh, and all the, you know, player customizations that can be done. So we then hit the gameplay bit. And again, it's all edited to look very seamless. Your teammate drops in from the sky. That looks cool. It evokes the fantasy perfectly, but let's be real. It would be annoying as hell to wait for that animation and gameplay every time. Again, this is something that's there to sell the fantasy of the multiplayer elements and to make the suits look cool. Okay, so we then start flying around. Note the various scripted events, such as the animals. Well, they would be a custom event that would be triggered based off, I imagine, the player's position. 
This is really highly custom work that, you know, we would then find out would not be applied across the rest of the game for its entire duration. Same goes for the Ursix that they run into. They're both scripted events that likely existed to further sell the game to Patrick Soderlund. This demo, of course, was really meant to impress him, and this, well, that initial demo is what led to the E3 trailer. As for the rest of the demo, well, it's very basic. You have very early look in combat. There are some stunning weather effects. I mean, they truly are gorgeous. And that's almost certainly tech from an earlier form of um, Anthem during the prototyping stage, where it was more of an exploration and survival game. This is likely the sort of thing that would have to be cut in order to make it over the finish line, but more on that later. Now, you'll notice that throughout, the graphics are just stunning. They're gorgeous. Well, okay, some parts are clearly pre-rendered, don't forget that, but still, as for the gameplay, it looks gorgeous. And the thing is, this was likely captured on a rig with dual 1080 Ti's, or something like that. But here's the thing. This game would have to be shipped on an Xbox One, which has about the power of a 750 Ti. And that would mean that for most of its release configurations, many of these effects would not have performed well. Okay, so why just not include those as options in PC? Well, the thing is, the more graphical options and systems that a developer has, the more they commit to fully supporting in their product. Teams only have limited technical resources, so overall the team will have to cut some things in order to get a super stable version of the game that they can realistically ship on all systems. Here's the thing though, even with cutting down those more impressive systems, Anthem still ran very poorly on launch. Much of this also actually happened to Watch Dogs, and while it doesn't seem to have had a tr as troublesome as a development process as Anthem did, I think it's pretty clear that the scope was cut down at some point, although the ability to re-enable many of the cut graphical effects being left in the launch PC build that was rather wild. Now, so far, you're probably thinking that these trailers are essentially a bunch of lies. Well, with Anthem, they kind of were. I mean, six months after this E3 reveal trailer, the game itself only had one mission implemented. Indeed, this trailer really was just the best guess at what they could have hoped to have achieved, and they kind of managed to, well, fail even at that. And this all begs the question, what are these trailers and demos for? Well, if it's consumer-facing, then it exists to market the game. If it's an internal publisher-facing demo, then it exists to sell the fantasy that the team wishes to deliver to their publisher. With extremely early demos of troubled games, well, often they end up being both, and that's where we see this massive problem. These sort of end of pre-production made trailers often represent the most polished up, best case version of what the team currently has. They're often made before production fully starts, which does beg the question, why does the production of a game sometimes decrease its quality? Well, as time goes on, when you're, you know, when something's being made, problems will reveal themselves. We all know this from our own jobs. Graphical systems not playing, you know, nicely in all situations across the game. Indeed, many of the effects seen in that Anthem demo, they looked amazing, but they may not have properly worked with all of the scenes in the game. Uh, you know, of course, they were probably developed being a quick prototype and were probably not super scalable and reusable and production ready and maybe did not have good developer tools to implement them with. This could mean that maybe you'd have some effects that just would not survive the production and keeping them in would damage the team's ability to deliver. You see, often pre-production is a small team of veterans working to make the best slice of a game that they can but often things change when that morphs into a far larger team putting it through production. This means that sometimes really tough uh, decisions have to be made. An extra feature, even a rendering one, might cause extra work. For an example, lighting is extremely taxing in hardware. To get around this, developers often use, you know, tricks like pre-baking their light maps. But the thing is, many times these tricks will involve a fair amount of manual work. Manual work that might not end up being feasible and that might mean that some things would have to be cut that would, say, lead to a reduction in lighting quality, and indeed that is something that we have seen in many trailer downgrades. This sort of thing happens throughout, and I even have my own example in this. So this is a title that we were working on called How to Kill Monsters. It's on hiatus now, and we worked on a publisher-facing gameplay slice. So it has sounds, full animations, a bunch of stuff. You can pick up a weapon from the ground and you can use it for unique attacks with some very basic combos. You can swap your weapons. The enemy Kaiju has multiple phases. We even actually had the ability to do per limb damage effects and stuff like that. And then there's your big beefy execution animation at the end. It suggests a lot as a demo, a lot that's not there. Sure, we could have made that demo 10 more times easily, 
But doing so would not have left us with a completed game. Uh, creating it involved us making a bunch of tech, some, you know, dynamic animation systems, skinning systems, loads of rigging work, limb damage, far, far more on top of that. Yet, it was not a full game. Like that Anthem reveal, and I know it's apples and oranges, like what we had there was basically trying to sell the basic idea of the mechanics and the fantasy of playing the game. The thing is that unlike the Anthem reveal, that was not a big public trailer that we were going to be selling copies or a Kickstarter with. It was something that we developed quickly over 12 weeks for a competition. So if we were forced to release that game, you know, I can guarantee that we would have needed to have cut loads of our systems and to have simplified the game, which would mean that if we had sold it based on what that demo suggested, it probably would not have been representative. So that's my own experience of things, of course, at a minuscule scale. Uh, even from the perspective of people making the game, it's just very hard to know what a game will look like in two years. But here's the thing though, publishers should take this on board and they should market their games responsibly with this in mind. Thing is, they don't. They are perfectly happy to hype people up by showing things that they very likely know will never make it into the full game. They exploit customers not knowing how the sausage is made. And let's be real, the customer shouldn't be expected to know that. It's not their darn job to know how a game is made. The game's there for them to have fun and to enjoy. Because of this, we're left with one set of options. You can't trust E3 demos. Don't pre-order. Sadly, publishers are attempting to make that harder and harder by having more incentives for pre-ordering, like early access. But at least for these big AAA games where, you know, half the times the development ends up being a disaster, you kind of just can't trust them. And that really is quite sad. For my part, I can guarantee you this, I will never open up a pre-order or a Kickstarter or anything if I am not entirely certain, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, that I can fully deliver on the demo or the trailer. Um, as always, you know, I look at how customers are treated by AAA and often, you know, I just think, well, I want to do the opposite of that. And that's a bit of a guiding light in some, in some areas. So there you go, that's a discussion of E3 trailers. Of course, we're coming up to that period of time, so it's worth keeping it all in mind. And I hope you enjoyed this. Patrons, I'm going to release a cut of that demo to you as a BTS, I need to polish it up first. And uh, the next deep dive will be up super soon over there. Of course, the patrons support these videos, they make them happen, and I really thank them for it. So with that, thank you all for watching. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.